Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. Father, I just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. God, we're <laughs> a grateful people. Grateful because you haven't forgot us. Grateful because you haven't left us. Grateful for your mercy. Grateful for your love. Grateful for your compassion. You know, Lord, I'm grateful for the plan of God from the beginning of time until now for mankind. And I'm grateful we're learning how to adapt to it, how to be part of it. And I thank you, Father, as you touch the hearts of each of us tonight and bring us to where that place would be. Now, Lord, not only bless us, but bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Jesus' mighty name, everybody say amen. amen. Real quick, I just want to share a story with you. I was out at the food lines, a guy named Reuben. You know Reuben probably if you saw him. He's been around the church for like ever, you know. And Reuben comes up to me. He drives a little bus that we have that we, we, we do everything we can to give dignity to people that are in food lines, let them know that we love them, appreciate them, we give them water, we, we, we feed their kids, we tell them how wonderful they are and how great it is, because I'm believing that they're going to get a hold of God that won't be in a food line long. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm believing they're going to get the things of God and start operating in the principles of God, and God starts to bless them. Reuben is, drives this little bus that takes people back to their car after they've got so many groceries, all of a sudden, he get out of it. I just saw Reuben. All of a sudden, he gets out of, out of his bus, and he runs over to me, and he says this to me, and it just like caught me off guard. I was like kind of turning from one person to the other person, you know, like, you know, and sometimes I turn, and, you know, I'm, I'm not real solid on my feet. And, and uh, so Reuben comes up to me, and he says these words to me. He says, Pastor, do you know why Jesus denied, excuse me, do you know why Peter denied Jesus uh, three times before the cock crowed. I said, what are, what are you talking about, Reuben? We're out here in a food line. I'm thinking, what is this? I, I, I said, Reuben, I don't want to talk theology right now. I just want to greet these people. He says, I just want to know something, Pastor. Could you explain to me that? I said, it's simple. I said he was in fear. He was, uh, you know, he didn't want to be associated with Jesus because he was afraid of being persecuted. He's afraid of persecution, just like all of us. Sometimes we don't want to be, a, you know, associated with Jesus because we're afraid of what people might think of us. That's what it was like. He says, Pastor, you missed it. That's so wrong. And he turns around and he walks away. And I'm thinking, what kind of people are we building here at the Rock Church? <laughs> And World Outreach Center, what kind of, what kind of like theology is this, you know? I know I'm right. In a few minutes, a bus comes back. He gets out of the bus. And he runs to me with his Bible. He says, Pastor, can I show you the verse that tells exactly what it is, why Jesus uh, was denied by Peter and why Peter denied Jesus? I said, sure. He goes with me to Luke, the fourth chapter. See how smart you are. Put it up on the overhead. Luke, fourth chapter. Verse number 38 says, and now he arose, speaking, notice capital H in the word he, speaking of Jesus arose of the synagogues and entered Simon. The word Simon's house right there is Peter before Jesus changed his name from Simon to Peter. So this is Peter. Okay, and Peter's the one who denied Jesus. He says Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made a request of him concerning her. Verse number 39. Now I'm reading this out in the parking lot, right? Verse number 39. So he stood over her and he rebuked the fever and it was left her. And immediately she arose and served them. And he says, there you go. That's the reason why Peter denied Jesus. I said, there's nothing in those verses whatsoever. What are you talking about? But thinking, oh my goodness, what, is, what kind of a church is this that we've got people getting something? I said, where did you find, what do you find that in there? He says, can't you see it? It's right there. Look back, if you will. He says at verse 38, Jesus healed the mother-in-law of Peter. <laughs> And I said, oh, shut up, get back in the bus. <laughs> Don't mother-in-laws get it, huh? Man, I mean, mother-in-laws are really picked on all the time. Anyway, tonight's message is kind of a cool message. I really wanted to share this with you. Simple message. Conditions. Here's some conditions. I'll give you four of them tonight for prosperity. Now, let me talk to you just for a moment. When I use the word prosperity, 
I am not using the word as if I'm talking just exclusively about money in your pocket. Even though God's not against you having money in your pocket. God wants to bless you in every area of your life. He wants to bless your children. He wants to bless your marriage. He wants to bless your grandchildren. He wants to bless your home. He wants you to have a nice home. He wants you to have a nice car. He wants you to have things that you could only dream of. God wants to prosper every area of your life. Even he wants to have you have a wonderful relationship with your mother-in-law, Reuben. <laughs> and so here we find that God really wants that. You know, you can start right in the beginning where God's talking in the book of Genesis, creating the heavens and the earth. And he comes and he creates the planet and he creates a garden and he puts man in the garden. The very first place God takes man, stop and think about it, is not a junkyard, is not the ghetto, is not the hood, is not a trash pipe he eat. The very first place that God takes man is to the most beautiful place you can ever imagine, a garden. The Bible says there's gold in the garden and flowers and smells. The Bible says there are uh, uh, stones that are beyond our comprehension that are valuable, worth, uh, full of uh, value and worth stones in the garden. It was without a doubt, it produced the best food that ever could be produced. It was a garden place for man to live upon the planet. And then because man decides to do something different than what God says, all of a sudden the blessings that God wanted for mankind left. And there was trouble in the land. Horrible trouble in the land. In very difficult times. In fact, you will see all of that. We find ourselves in life doing God our way instead of doing God his way. And when you do God, listen to me now, your way, instead of doing God his way, you end up failing. And that's what God is saying throughout the whole Old Testament, New Testament. If you'll come back to me and do what I ask you to do, your life will get blessed. Listen to me. Because God knows how to bring his people to a place of blessing. And so many times for all of us, we need to a time to time to time to time to examine our hearts to see where we're really at. And this has been a time in my life where I've examined my life. And I really believe I was about ready to make the wrong decisions in life. And I was really believe, believing I was doing the wrong thing. And, and God had to get me to examine the depths of my heart. And in the depths of my heart, I knew the will of God. I knew what God wanted to bless me and prosper me. I knew that God wanted to heal my life. I knew that God wanted to do great, mighty, marvelous things. But I was doing God oftentimes, like everybody else, my way. If it was convenient for me, if it was the way I think it ought to be, or the way I see it, my best effort instead of his best effort through me, which is a big difference, by the way. And I find myself, just like Adam and Eve, divorcing myself from the very blessings that God wants to provide for us. Listen to me, my friends, because oftentimes we find ourselves in those places. We find in the fourth chapter, right after the fall of man, the very next chapter, Adam and Eve have two children by the name of Cain and Abel. You know the story. Cain was born first. He was a tiller of the land. That means he's a farmer, produced products and crops. The very next verse, you'll find that You'll find that Cain was born, and there was one that was born after him by the name of Abel. And he was a keeper of the sheep. And he was one who brought up the sheep. He was like a rancher, if you would. And then you'll find, as you go through the scripture, that they both bring an offering to God. We've been learning a lot about that recently in, in, out of the book of Hebrews and how good it was. It was wonderful. But I just want to share this about it. And I want to point out something with you about this. Is that Cain had an opportunity to do the right thing, but he did the wrong thing. The interesting part about it is that they both brought offerings. You'll find as you read the scripture, the first few verses there in the fourth chapter of Genesis. You'll find that here is Cain, a tiller of the ground, brings an offering from his crop to God. 
In other words, he's bringing fruit and vegetables. And that's what Cain was made of. That's what Cain did. That was his livelihood. That was what was important to him. That's the way Cain saw life. And then you find, if you will, that Abel brings from the first fruit his first of the flock that was born, sacrificed it to God a certain way. And you see God in the next part of that verse saying this, I accept the sacrifice of Abel, but I reject the sacrifice of Cain. And oftentimes for years I was labored over that. Why would he favor one and reject the other? I mean, didn't the guy put in the best effort he could? Well, the question is, obviously, you would think he did, but he didn't. The Bible tells us an interesting thing if you go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Now, this is fascinating, that Cain, by faith, offered a better offering. Now, wait a minute. By what? Faith. By what? Faith. By faith offered a better offering. So, in other words, Cain's offering was the one that was accepted by God, right? Uh, excuse me. Abel's offering was uh, the one that was accepted by God. Cain's offering was rejected by God. But it says in the scripture that Abel offered a better offering to God because it was accepted by God. By faith, he did that. Now, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, he had to hear the plan of God for his life, and he didn't do it the way God said, he did it the way he thought it should be. Did his best effort, which you need to do, but it wasn't the way God would have it to be. And God is saying something to all of us. We find ourselves oftentimes just like Cain and just like Abel, where we know what to do with God, but we kind of circumvent it a little bit. We kind of get to the place where we say, you know, don't know if I'm really going to do that, that much or that way. I know I'll do it, you know, a different way. I'll do it, um, uh, I'll do it, but I won't do it full, wholehearted. And that's what Cain was doing. He didn't do it wholehearted. Abel did it according to what God said. Somewhere along the line, either God spoke to them or their mom and dad, Adam and Eve, spoke to them and told them how to make the right offering to God. Somewhere along the line, they knew what to do and they went out and did what they thought the way it should be instead of, and so Abel's accepted. Cain isn't. And God sees Cain after his offering is is rejected. God comes to Cain and says, you know, why are you just down and out? And listen to the words, if you will, in the fourth verse, chapter, in verse, if you will, verse number six. So let's pop it up on the overhead. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? So can you imagine Cain? He brought his offering to God and the offering was rejected. Why was it rejected? Because Cain knew what the right offering was, but he wouldn't do it. He did it his way. Just like Adam, just like Eve before them, just like all of Israel, just like so many of us today. We have a relationship with God if it's based on what we are and what we are instead of who he is. And God makes this, and why are you angry? I mean, this guy is really angry. This guy is frustrated. He's probably mad at God. He's probably mad at Abel. He's mad at everybody. He did the best he could. What is this? I don't understand it. Somebody ought to pat me on the back for doing something. But he did it the wrong way. What he did was wrong. And with, I found out with God over the years, if it's just a little crack in the procedures, it's a no-go with God. If there's a little shadow of variance from what God says, God doesn't have to bless you. And he usually won't bless you until it's right on. Because if he blesses you when it's not right on, you'll stay off and you won't get on. Are you listening to me? And so he'll hold back those blessings, those prosperity that God wants to put on you. Oftentimes because we're doing God our way instead of doing things God's way. Why are you angry? Why is your continence fallen? I mean, the guy's probably really, you know, storming through the house, getting angry, ugly, getting through the whole thing. And then verse number seven comes along. The most interesting thing, God wants to make it right with Cain. He's not mad at Cain. He's not going to strike him with lightning. He's not going to kill him. He's not going to do anything. You know, see, here's the loving God that we have. When we do things our way, God's still waiting for us to do things his way and still loves us until we do. Did you get that? Yeah. Let me say it again for you. I don't know if I can but it was pretty good. God's waiting for us to do things his way. And he loves us until we do. And he's always there to bless us until we finally grow up enough to realize this is about him and not about me. Come on, somebody. 
And so he says, to, he says this, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? Verse number seven, pop it up for me, will you please? If you do well, you ever thought about what well is? Well is what God says. Uh, he did not do what God says. He did not do well. But if you do well, he comes along, will you not be accepted? In other words, I'm not a respecter of persons. I accepted Abel. He did it the way I told him to do it. He lived out life the way I was supposed to live out life. He's doing that. Now, here's the deal. Here we are as Christians, and we want Christianity to be what we think it ought to be instead of what he says it to be. Now, the whole thing is that God wants to prosper you. He knows how you should live on this planet. I'll give you an illustration of that. If you had a child that's four years old and he wants to bust out the front door all the time and get outside and run the street, you would spank him. Because eventually as he stays in the street, he's going to either get hit by a car or get run over or get seriously injured or die. You would not want your child to be in a place that would cause harm to them. So God says, I'm going to put you in the middle of this fallen planet and I'm going to take you and I don't want harm to come to your home, your family, your children, your marriages. I don't want harm to come to your health. I don't want harm to come to your economics. I, don't want, I want to bless you. I want to make you prosperous. I want to help you. But in order for that to happen, you're going to have to follow correctly my directions. And he comes along and he says, if you do well, follow in my directions, listen, you'll be accepted. If you do not, then sin crouches at your door, desires you, and you should rule over it. In other words, here's sin going to try to stop you all the time. Don't let it get a hold on you. Rule over it and take it out. He goes out the next couple of verses, you see that he kills Cain. Excuse me, Cain kills Abel. And he murders his brother. So here's Cain. He's totally screwed up now. And he's out, literally an outcast from the things of God. And God still doesn't call down fire from heaven to destroy him. He just sends him off by himself. And there's a part of people in that bloodline, if you will, that are out there today that just are just God rejectors. And that's what Cain is. He's just a God rejector of the way. Unless God does things his way, it doesn't work that way. Now, I was talking with my Bible college class the other night. Something just jumped out at me. First Samuel, if you will, go there with me. First Samuel, the 12th chapter. Before I read you the verses, let me explain the story to you. Here we find Israel in a miserable condition. They have rejected God. Get this, get this, you gotta get this. They have rejected God. It's, in fact, if you go to 1 Samuel, the eighth chapter, you'll find that to me that's the saddest chapter in the Bible. Because they go to God and they say to God, God, we do not want you to be our king anymore. We do not want you to be our leader. We do not want you to protect us. We don't want you to deliver us. We don't want you anymore. We want a king like everybody else. And we want a king. And they go to Samuel and they tell Samuel, Samuel, we want a king like every other nation. And they have literally rejected God. And you could see the, the depth of hurt inside as you read the scriptures of the heart of God. And God says to Samuel, Samuel, give him a king. They want a king, give him a king. And of course, you know, Saul comes. And Saul's really a pretty good guy, but he doesn't have any experience about anything. He doesn't know how to deal with people. He doesn't know how to deal with life. But he's a compromiser in the things of God. And it proves out that he fails later on in life. And it becomes a horrible king. I want to read you, if I may, God's attitude towards Israel after he gives them the king, after they have rejected God and done things their own way instead of God's way. you got to get this because it's really cool. In 1 Samuel 12, chapter, verse number 12, And when you saw that Nahash, the king of Amorites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, then the Lord your God, when the Lord your God was your king. I mean, stop and think about it. God was their king. They've rejected God. Now they want a king of their own. They want a human man king. And here he makes this statement. He says, when the Lord your God was your king. It's like a broken heart. But then he makes a statement. The statement that he makes is so different than me. I would have made a statement like this. And you dirty, rotten rats that rejected me and do things your own way, forget you. You got your king, let me tell you something. You're out for misery. 
That's what I would have said. But God doesn't say that. The most interesting thing takes place. It's the very next verse, God starts to say something. Remember, we see Cain, we see Abel, we see Adam, Eve, we see all of these people. Some do it their way, some do it God's way. And here are these people doing it their way, not doing it God's way. God gives them the king, and now he makes a statement to them. Listen to the statement that he makes in verse, if you will, in verse number 13. He says, and now therefore, here is the king of whom you have chosen and whom you desire. And take note, the Lord has set a king over you. So God approved it. It's approved by the people. It's a done deal. And God, I would have thought, oh my, let's send these people to hell. I mean, they made a mistake. They started doing things their own way. They don't want God. They want God in their own terms. But here's what God says, which is so fascinating. If you will, go with me in this verse 14. If you fear the Lord and serve him, obey his voice, and do not rebel against the commandments of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. And then he goes on, he says, however, and he starts to set the law. If you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against, rebel against, rebel against the commandments, just like Cain, rebelled against the commandments of God and did it his own way stopping the blessings that were waiting for him. Yeah. And he comes along and he says, if you rebel against the commandments of the Lord, then hand, uh, the hand of the Lord will be against you as, as it was against your fathers. Verse 16, let's pop that up if you have it. Let's take a look at it. Now therefore stand. Now listen to how positive God is. Stand and see the great things which the Lord will do before your eyes. God doesn't leave them on a negative point. He says, here it is. Listen, stand and see the great things God wants to do for you. And the cry tonight is for every one of us in here. We have to search our hearts to make sure that we're not doing God our way, but we do God his way. We have to search our hearts if we have been doing it our own way to be smart enough to repent and say, God, I believe in you and I really know you want my best. And God says to them, I will prosper you. I will bless you. I will be with you. Did you know that the line of David, which Jesus came out of, which is an eternal line, when it says the house of David is for eternity, the reason the house of David is for eternity is because David had Jesus, and he's an eternal God. And did you know that could have come from the line of Saul? But Saul rejected it as the first king of Israel because of his sin, doing things his own way and compromising his life. And oftentimes we Christians do the same thing and we wonder why God doesn't bless us. He doesn't bless us because we're compromised somewhere. Just like Cain, just like, it's the same old story and that's why almost every story after every story after every story in the Bible says the same thing. Did you know that? It's in different ways. So that you and I get the picture. You know what, this is really not about me. This is really about me living for him. This is really about me doing his will. Really about me doing his way. Really about me doing everything he wants and nothing I want because what I've got is eternity waiting for me. In the meantime, God will prosper you if you do it. Oh my goodness, sakes alive. That's what's so amazing about all of this. We forget this principle all the time. We circumvent that which God says with our own emotions and our own feelings. We're oftentimes just like Cain coming along saying, I will give you the offering, but I'll do it my way. Right offering, wrong offering, an offering that's compromised is a completely wrong offering and unacceptable to God. If there is a smidgen off, it is completely, totally off with God. If there's a gray area, if there's a shadow from his word, then it's totally off from God. Now, his mercy comes in. Don't mi misunderstand me. His mercy comes in. His love comes in and covers us just like then. Hey, Cain, you screwed up, but I'm willing to make things right with you. It's all you have to do is the right way. Hey, Israel, you screwed up, and, but look, listen to what it says. If you do these things, man, I'll be with you. All of a sudden, they missed it. Let's not us miss it. For thousands of years, God's been saying the same thing to humans. 
This is really about your relationship with God and how close you're going to stay to the shepherd. And the closer you are to the shepherd, the safer and the more prosperous and the better places he'll take you. Come on, somebody. So here we find this interesting verse, and verse number 14 gives us four insights into, if you will, conditions of prosperity. Four insights. Notice what it says in verse number 14. Circle them. If you fear, if you serve, if you obey, and you do not rebel. How simple is the gospel? How simple is theology? How simple is your walk with God? God wants to take you back to the garden where life is good. Because he's like a loving father, just like you care about your kids. You don't want misery and horror for your kids. You want the blessings of God for your children. You want to be successful. You want to be happy. You want to be filled. And here's how it is. It's really about this. It's really about whether or not you're going to compromise in your walk with the things of the Lord. Let's take a look at these. Number one. Listen to what it says, and this is a good one. Verse number one, it says this. If, the biggest word in the Bible, all through the scripture, if you fear the Lord. Can I just briefly just say this to you? I'm going to take five more minutes, and I'm going to close. If you fear the Lord. Remember, I taught you for 30 years, I've taught you these words. Fear is like a two-sided coin. One side says, I'm afraid I'm absolutely petrified to mess with God. I'm not screwing around with God because God's going to get me. And I'm afraid of the repercussions. I'm afraid of plain, simple, I'm, I'm afraid God not to do it. The other side of the word fear is reverence. I totally respect and reverence you. It's like so amazing when you get this, if you will have such a reverence for God that when he, you get the revelation of what he is, he wants you to do. And you may be at a very beginning level with Christ right now. And you don't know what he wants you to do and how this all works out. And you're learning how to do that. And that's really cool. But be patient with yourself. Guess what? It's not going to happen overnight that you learn everything. And you're going to find yourself in a place, my friends, where you're going to see yourself doing something, doing more and more of the things of God and God opening more and more of the windows of heaven and blessings. And God's going to provide and prosper you and open doors for you that no man can close. And you find yourself in these places, but it starts with this word fear. In fact, wisdom starts with fear. Everything starts with fear. Until I'm afraid of God, Cain wasn't. Wait a minute, let me say it again. Maybe you didn't get it. Until I'm afraid of God, Cain wasn't. Until I respect God so much that what his word says, got to go beyond my feelings. His word is more important than my feelings. Then I find myself in a place, my friends, where I'm not fearing God to the level that I need to fear God. Yeah. Dr. Richard Kanga is on the front row, is my, my friend. He, I call him my doctor pastor because he's a wild man. He's got three MD degrees. Who has three MD degrees? I mean, he's like crazy. Probably the most intelligent man I've ever met in my life. Dr. Kanga, wave at us. Part of our church, and well, I love you, my brother. I call him belly aching a few weeks back. And he says to me these words. He says, well, respectfully. He's trying to be respectful to me. He knows who I am and everything. And I could care less about who I am at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm broken. I'm in pain. I'm failing. Things are lousy. I'm worse off than I've ever been. And uh, I just called the doctor and said, I'm worse now than I was before surgery. And he's panicking. I called my friend, Dr. Richard. He says, well, I think it's time to stop praying so much and start praising God. I'm thinking, shut up, man. I'm, I'm the preacher here. Like, you're the doctor, MD? Shut up. And I have taught that like a thousand times. Start, it's time to start praising God. And I got off the phone, tell you the truth, I put the phone down and I stood up and from the depths of my being, on the inside, 
Something just came out of me. It came out of every part of my body. I started praising him and worshiping him. I was in my living room and I was praising him and I was worshiping him. I was hurting and I was hurting and I was hurting and I was praising God. From that moment on, from that moment on, I started getting better and better and better and better. I have a, a wonderful doctor who was a surgeon, a great Christian man who did the surgery on me, and I just loved him so much. When I was, before I talked to Dr. Kanga, I talked to him, and he said, you've got to go in for some x-rays. I went in for a CAT scan. And he couldn't get to me for a week. A week later, they read the CAT scan, but by this time, I'm feeling good. So when he came in the room, he said this to me. He says, uh, man, how are you? And I said, well... I have to tell you, I so apologized for a week ago crying, belly aching to you and telling you I was miserable because right after I got off the phone with you, I started praising God. And I feel great. I mean, I'm, I, 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 instead of being a, a 10, which is a maximum pain, I, I'm probably an 8. And I can tolerate it. I'm pr doing pretty good. He says, oh, my goodness. He says, that's great. He says, but I looked at your x-rays, and they failed. The surgery didn't work. What we have to do, he says... We've got to reopen you up in the back because I have a scar about that long in my back and my spine. He said, I'd take everything out that's in there. Then I'm going to sew you back up, turn you all on your back and open your stomach up and take everything out of your stomach so I can get to your spine and go at it from that side. Debbie pipes up and says, what's the percentage of... of, uh, of you, how much do you think, what is the chances of complete healing? He said, about 60%. I looked at him, and can I just say this to you? If he was here in the room, I'd say this. I wasn't much of a Christian. I said, it'll be a cold day, and you know what? Uh, before I let you cut me open again, man, God's going to heal me. That's all, that's all there was. God's going to heal me. And I'm going to tell you something, from that day on, I, I, I mean, I, my pain level is like 20%, maybe 30 right this very moment. I'm still a little shaky because I'm going to get my strength back, but there'll be a day when you see that. Now, here's my point. My point is, until I reverenced and feared God, can there ever be praise? Because great praise comes, it breaks through in times of trouble, times of hardship, when you're down and out and don't know where to go, when you're hurting and you don't know how to do it, instead of crying to God, just start praising him for who he is. And all of a sudden, the prisons are open doors and, and you, the chains start to fall off and the doors are open and the healing starts coming and all of a sudden, it changes your whole world. But it will never happen if there isn't starting with a fear of God. Second thing he says is that you not only have to fear him, you're going to have to serve him, which is an interesting thing. To serve someone means to treat him as if he's the master. In other words, what he's asking you to do is take a humble position. A humble position says, God, you're great and you're mighty, and I'm submissive to you, and I take a subordinate position to you, and I want to do things your way. You're, I'm in your service. You're not in my service. I'm in your service. Most Christians think so oftentimes that God is just, we're, he's here to serve us instead of us being here to serve his will. My friends, he says the second thing is to serve God. And it takes a humble person, one that gets out of himself and gets into God. May I say it like this? Uh, if I can. Without humility, there will never be the praise. Very important for us to see. Without humility, there will never be the praise. Without fear, remember number one was fear? Without fear, listen to this, or respect of fear, there will never be the praise. All of us need to understand this. this is such simple things. The third thing that he says for all of us to look at he said, I'm asking you to not only fear me and respect me, not only to serve me in my will, to be hum take a second subordinate position to me instead of me being there for you, you be there for me. You be there for my will, my way, my want, instead of your will, your way, your want. 
And he comes along and he says, now I need you to do something. I need you to be obedient. Simplest thing in the world. And that's where Saul broke down. That's where, if you will, this is where Cain missed it. There was no obedience there. You will find throughout all of Israel, every time Israel failed, it was because of a lack of obedience. Every person that has ever failed with Jesus Christ, and that's not Jesus that's failing. He's there ready to love them, ready to hug them, ready to bring them back, ready to say, come on, let's make it anew. Come on, let's do this over again. Let's start from the beginning. Let's get it going. I know you made a mistake. I know you failed. I know you gave up on me. I know you quit on me. I know you didn't care about me. I know you were into yourself, but I'm here with open arms. Come on home. And for every person, God says this. He wants us to obey because without obedience, there is absolutely nothing we're going to get done that's going to catch the heart of God to bring the praise of God. He said, without obedience, there is always, like Saul and like Cain, compromise. Obedience is not easy when you're an independent person making decisions for yourself and you have feelings and you have intellect and you have understanding, it's not easy. Don't think it is. Figure it out how to make life work. You figure it out how to work in society. You figure it out how to work in the social system. You figure out how to get by. You know how to make things operate. Guess what? All of a sudden you're on the road and it's your own road instead of being obedient to him. The fourth thing that he says is fascinating is do not rebel. And where there's rebellion, there is poverty. Let me say it again. Where there is rebellion, there is poverty. That's one of the things you'll see from the Old Testament to the New Testament is anything that rebels against the ways of God ends up in poverty. Does God want you there? Absolutely not. For God so loved the world that God broke from his side. His son sends him to the earth in the likeness of man to go to the cross and die on that cross to show his love for every one of us and his blood, the atonement on the cross for your sins now and in the future that his grace would be there to take care of every one of us. But still, he wants to bless you. And the way to get the blessings is to be obedient and not rebel. Rebel says, Cain, I'll do it my way. Rebel says, I know what I'm doing. I don't care what you say. This is easier for me. This is more convenient. That doesn't make sense. This makes sense. When doctor told me to get out of my seat and praise, that did not make sense. But it's from that moment on, my friends, it was in a couple of days later that I was out of that chair and in a bed. And I want you to know something. I'm up here wobbling around here tonight, but I'm still telling you the truth. The truth is that God wants to prosper you in every area of your life. And if you're going to live a life that's compromised, you're not going to get it. A little bit of a shadow, a little bit of a tint of, of things that are not God's way will be an absolute no to your, to your prayers. And until you do it the ways the Lord would have you to do it. You're going to have to get out of yourself, get into God. Four quick little things. Listen to this. Fear him. Serve him, obey him, and then simply don't back off, which a lot of people do, and they forget, and they disobey. Saints, that's what God would have for you tonight. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> come on, somebody. The devil's a liar! And he's defeated! And he will not have your future! Your future belongs to God! Great and mighty is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who is the only one, the creator of the heavens and of the earth! His name is Jesus, and the devil will not have your goods, will not have your family, will not have your marriage, will not have your children, will not have your finances. And that's 
the truth. Sit down, you wild saints of God. Love you guys a lot. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Listen closely to what I'm going to say. Some of you have been living compromised lives with God. You call yourself a Christian, but did you know you can't be a Christian just calling yourself a Christian? Any more than you can call yourself a fish, go sit in the ocean for six months, you're just going to come out and be a slimy human being. <clears throat> you can't call yourself a Christian and you're a Christian. In order for you to be a Christian, it takes something. Jesus said you must be born again, John 3rd chapter. What's born again mean? From the beginning of the Bible, the end of the Bible, here's what God's after, all of your heart and all of your life, period. It's an all or nothing relationship. Saul, compromised. The children of Israel, compromised. Cain, compromised. And many others in the Bible, compromised. And you don't have to. Tonight, in this place, give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. You know whether you've done that or not and whether you've held to it or you've compromised in your walk. Some of you need to make a refreshing commitment to God tonight. Some of you in this place tonight need to give a first-time commitment to God. All of your heart and all of your life. And start fearing Him, learning how to do that. Start serving Him, learning how to do that. Start obeying him, learning how to do that. And then don't ever rebel against it. Keep going forward. Yeah, times are tough. We live in a fallen world. But God will be there to make sure you get on the stay on and walk on the right track. Tonight, here you are all across this auditorium. Jesus makes a statement. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. It can't happen any other way. You're not going to get to heaven your way. Being good, going to church, learning scripture, going to seminary school, that won't get you to heaven. You must be born again. And that means you're going to have to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. That's what it says, Romans. It's an all or nothing relationship. Not just a little wishy-washy, compromised relationship once in a while, Jesus. It's an all or nothing, Jesus. This church has always preached that. And here you are in this place, and tonight in this friendly place, we've laughed, we've shouted, we've clapped. You were gracious enough to let me minister tonight to you. And I want you to know the spirit of love is in this place. And you can get right with God tonight in this place and make, give him all. And I'm talking about all of your heart. Some of you have been coming to church once in a while, you used to come all the time. Some of you come to church just on Sunday morning, somehow tonight you got here. Some of you used to be deeply committed and you've been backing off. That's called, it's getting you in that compromised position. You're starting to go in a different way. You say, oh, I still love God. He still loves me. Yep, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. But it won't be long before it's less and less of God. With God, I find that the more you go for him, the more he goes for you. Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do, but then it's time to run back to him. And tonight is your night to run back to him. I'm going to count to three all across this auditorium. Back in the family rooms, I'm talking to you. In the upper balconies, I'm talking to you wherever you're at. In the foyer by television, I'm talking to you online. God bless you guys. We love you. Wherever you're at tonight, we'll make that whole heart commitment to Jesus Christ. Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. When you hear this sound, bang! Your hand goes up. Let me see it. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yep, you will. But who cares? Being embarrassed for a moment is okay. Much more important, much better than being in hell forever and ever and ever. Your call. Do it Cain's way or do it Abel's way. Your call. I want you to make a statement. I want Jesus more. All across this auditorium. First time, for sure, if you're making a recommitment of your life, I'm speaking to you also. So tonight is your night of salvation. All across this auditorium. I'm counting to three. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure I'm speaking to you. Tonight is your night. Don't be afraid. Here it is. One, 
two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. Back over here. Thank you. There's three. Thank you. Back over here. There's four. God bless you. Anybody else? There's five. Thank you. How many back there? Just one? Just one? Five. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else on this side? Five people saying, I'm going to go for God tonight with all my heart, all my life. Anybody else? There's another one over here somewhere. Thank you. There's another one right there. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's a few more. Let's just do this all at once. If you feel like you need to do this, just do it. Don't, don't be that rebellious person. Be the person that says, man, I just want to flow with the Spirit of God. If God wants me to do this, as embarrassing as it is, I'll do it. There's five or six people, four or five, six people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, there's another one. Thank you. God bless you. Where is that? Way over, way over here. Thank you. God bless you. I see you. Put your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Five or six people. Okay. All five or six of you that raised your hands, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff, get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me in front. That's so what I want you to do is get your stuff, get in this aisle, meet me right here in front. No one leaves during this period of time. If you raise your hand and you're serious about God, you get out of your seat, come on up front. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, come on. There's another five or six of you that I know without a doubt need to come. Get your stuff. Just nudge your neighbor and say, come on, I'll go with you. Get out of your seat. Meet me right here in front. I'm going to sit down and wait for you as you come. Come on. Come on. Let's, let's give them a hand as they come. Amazing love, how can it be? Come on, home. He my king will die for me. Amazing love. <laughs> Come on home. I honor you in all I do. I honor you in all I do. <laughs> That's great. I honor you. Great. In all so cool. So cool. What's ahead of you is so simple. Surround yourself with people that are like-minded, that are want to go on with God. And I'm telling you, they'll keep you obedient and keep you serving and keep you loving God. Don't go back into the world. Right over here is our friend. He's waving at you. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. You know how you go to church, you think maybe they're nuts. Guess what? They're nuts over there. Dr. Kenga's really nuts. And, uh, but uh, nobody, he's, he's a good guy. No, not a problem at all. Make a left turn. Follow him right over there. He's going to pray with you. Come on. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.